Good morning. Welcome to the house of the Lord. And those of you joining us online, good morning to you also. We are in the book of Acts this morning, so if you have your Bibles, please turn to Acts chapter 16. The message is entitled, Leadership and Leadings, It's Christianity in Action. I think it's a very much bypassed or uh, just a section of scripture with great teachings on how the church and Christians are to behave when it comes to being led by the Holy Spirit. But apparently it, um, it seems to be lost on some. Well, we'll you, you be the judge as we go through this. So if you would stand, please, we'll take verses 1 through 10, the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16, verses 1 through 10. Then he came to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted to have him go on with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region, for they all knew that his father was Greek. And as they went through the cities, they delivered to them the decrees to keep, which were determined by the apostles and elders at Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing Mysia, they came down to Troas, and a, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Please be seated. This is such a powerful section of Scripture. There's always a message for each when God's Word is preached. I know that rhymes, it's not intentional, but it is very, I believe in it very strongly. There is always a message for each when God's word is preached. This is Paul's second time going into Gentile territory. He has with him Silas. <clears throat> it is about 17 years since the crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. Now, Paul was with Silas in Antioch in Syria, but they had enough teachers there. And Paul, he, he would be drawn to a region where he could be useful and where he could be of great value, and, and this area was it for sure. And there are two characters that we meet in this passage, Timothy, of course, and then there is the physician Luke. We get to Luke in 10. We get Timothy right away. The leadership that comes out of this, uh, our eyes on the Apostle Paul, and remember, with, when there is no leader, there is no head. And anything that is headless is a defect. And uh, if it is still moving, it's a monster. But uh, here, he is leading for sure. We get that right out the starting gate. It's through the, throughout the entire book of Acts, really. The, those being led, though, they come on the scene by verse Verse 10, well, they were already in it too, but verse 10 starts to come out. So looking at verse 1, then he came to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. Uh, this, after they had been to the churches in Syria and Cilicia, we get that in Acts chapter 15, 41. It has been... Five years since Paul has come to this region. At Lystra, where he is going to arrive, first he comes to Derby, uh, that you would get to Derby first, coming from Cilicia, and then to uh, Lystra, where he was stoned, not to death, but to pain. He didn't die, but he suffered. At Lystra, he had gone through that part of Stephen's experience, who died calling on the Lord. And it tells us here, behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy. Now, Timothy, uh, from Lystra, he witnessed Paul's persecution. Whether he watched them stone him or not, we're, we are not told. But he was in that church, in that city, and he was very much part of that. He would have been very much 
moved by what was going on there, and yet he was unhinged by Paul's stoning. In other words, he remained a disciple. He became a disciple when Paul came through there. And watching Paul suffer persecution like he did did not deter Timothy from being a follower. In fact, he had such a reputation, it spread through even up to Iconium, which is another city just to the north of, of Lystra. Paul's ministry, his leadership, along with his stoning, made a lifelong disciple of Timothy. It made a lifelong impression on Timothy. And through thick and thin, he is there with Paul to the end. He's not the only one. But we, you got to love Timothy. Paul loved him very much. And uh, some commentators picture Timothy as timid. Uh, I disagree with that very much. I don't find that in, in, the, in the scripture. I find it the other way, actually. Uh, Paul is the one, uh, well, the commentator said, well, he's always in need of encouragement because Paul encourages him so much. Timothy courageously attacked the interests of hell when Paul was there or when Paul was not there. Paul could dispatch Timothy because he was that uh, powerful of a disciple. And he did whatever Paul told him to do, as did Titus and others. And he remained, as I mentioned, with Paul, no matter what was going on. But he moved Paul's heart from the very beginning. Paul just fell in love with this young man. And we then, at least my, my take on it, is I begin to notice that it's Paul who's worrying about Timothy, not Timothy worrying about Timothy. And Paul writes to him, you know, you got some stomach problems, do this for that. And he's just doting on him like a loving father. Well, Paul twice says, you know, that mentions that Timothy was his son in the faith. And uh, in his letters, yeah, Paul is very much concerned about Timothy, uh, encouraging him. That doesn't mean that Timothy needed the encouragement any more than the rest of us do, but it does mean that Paul was, was concerned. And he, Paul was not only concerned about him, uh, Paul was concerned about Titus and Tychicus. You know, he, was, he even stopped ministry at one point because he didn't know where Titus was. What a heart this leader in our faith had for those who served with him. Uh, we have not even a hint of Timothy failing. He was ever ready and reliable. A tough cookie, you could even, you could even say. Uh, but that didn't stop Paul from being concerned because of, that's what we do. When we love somebody and that we know they're in dangerous areas, we, we are concerned. It says here, the son of a certain Jewish woman, here in verse 1, who believed, but his father was Greek. <laughs> now that's, Luke is the one writing this, and Luke is, is Macedonian. He's Greek, you could say. I mean, they might differ a little bit, but uh, he's not, it's not a derogatory, but his father was Greek. It's not, not that. But it does highlight the difficulties that Paul was faced with in sharing the gospel with a culture, uh, the cultural rift between the Jews and the Gentiles was, was quite, quite, quite deep. And Luke does not name the mother of Timothy. Paul will do that later. Eunice was her name, and he also names his grandmother, Lois, which demonstrates that Paul was plugged into the people. He was where the people were. He knew their names. He's ever careful about the names. You get to the, begin, the last chapter of Romans, Romans 16, and in those first few chapters, he's just laying out the names. Tell so-and-so I said hi. Tell you all these names because people counted to him. Uh, John chapter 10, it says, that Jesus says this, to him, that is the shepherd, the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Uh, there is, uh, the name is identity. It, it, it also oftentimes includes nature, not always. It is hopefully so, an a noble named person. But uh, here is Paul, uh, very mindful Luke leaves the name out for whatever reasons, but Paul was a man who, who cared about what a person's name was and put that face with the name. Anyway, Eunice and Lois, 
the mother and grandmother of Timothy, they were Jewish believers of Jesus Christ as their Messiah. The father of Timothy doesn't come into the picture. We have no record of him influencing Timothy one way or another, certainly not for Christianity. So ethnically, Timothy's mother was Jewish and his father was Greek. Um, so Paul, when he became Timothy's pastor, Paul found a ready foundation to build the faith on because of these two women. Because Paul tells us that you have known the scriptures from childhood because Eunice and Lois had surrounded his life, had poured into his life what the scriptures had said. Now, you can know Bible stories until you're blue in the face. That's not enough. you got to connect the dots. You have to come up with a systematic theology, an understanding of what you believe and what is going on. And so in uh, Genesis, when it says that God will save uh, the through the seed of the woman, we know, we connect that dot to the coming of Jesus Christ and the virgin birth. And so things like that. It's not enough to have Bible stories, but if you have them, there's something to build upon. And you younger Christians you raise, that are raised in a Christian home, you know all these Bible stories, and I'm just telling you it's not enough. And that would go true for adults too. Uh, always learning and never coming into the knowledge, Paul said about some, because they weren't connecting the dots, establishing a doctrine of this is what I believe, this is why I believe it, and I will not be moved from it. The purpose of doctrine is not to be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, but it is to find out what you believe and to move forward in the hand of God from that point on. And when that takes place, ministry also takes place, and so does suffering. You're not going to serve Jesus Christ without suffering. And uh, whether it is internal or external or both, you're going to suffer. Uh, God knows that when God created the heavens and the earth, he loved what he created, and it was good. And then sin came, and God was ready for it. He is ready from, from all eternity past. He was ready for it. And we're part of that solution. So let's never undervalue the value of a Christ-centered woman in the church, woman in the home, in this case, Eunice and Lois. Uh, here they exposed young Timothy early on to the scriptures. We get that in, in Paul's letters to Timothy, not here in Acts, but that's a little background on him, and it is a fantastic background. What are you going to do? What are you going to do if you're raised in a home with the word of God? What are you going to do with it? We're going to find out, aren't we? And uh, hopefully you're going to land on your feet, not on your head. Hopefully you'll be, uh, you know, how beautiful on the mountain, on the feet of those who bring the gospel. Amen. That's what the Bible says. Verse 2, he was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. And so there's this, this, that's a testimony. And that's a good testimony. Everybody's got a testimony. Whether it is good, lame, uh, or bad, or outstanding, we've got one before men. Uh, and, of course, always before the Lord. But this Timothy, no sense of entitlement with this young man. He had a reputation because he pursued God. David wrote in the Psalms, my soul follows hard after you. And I always think of a posse, you know. You know, rough riders, the wind, the dust kicked up, and they're hard on the trail. And, and, and putting it in the positive uh, this, those who pursue righteousness, and it is a rough trail. Uh, anyway, Timothy did something with his righteous upbringing. It was not wasted on him. He blazed a testimony, or you could say a reputation. And it is, uh, uh, he is an exciting addition to Paul's ministry. It's so hard to find young men that are, get involved. They're out there, and there are some, but uh, you would think they would be, you know, they would be lined up around the corner. Well, Timothy was, was one that Paul, and Paul identified it. Uh, there are others that will come along with, Tim, with Paul that won't be so exciting. Alexander, Hymenaeus, Demas will desert Paul, break his heart. Then there were the, the Corinthians, not all of them. But there was a, a hysterical element in the Corinthian church. 
I'll get back to that. Well, I'll, I'll just finish it here. Because there were also the Galatians, the region he's in now. And Paul, you know, Paul said to the Corinthians, it's a very, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you. I don't care about your negative uh, opinions. I know who I believe, and this is the gospel. And I will not stop the train to throw rocks at every dog that barks at me. This is the truth. Man, you've got to love that guy's leadership. It's there to learn from. And uh, he writes to them in 2 Corinthians, he says, For you put up with fools gladly, since you yourselves are wise. That's what he told his congregation. Man, how can you not like this man? To the Galatians, he says, Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? There was a time you would have gouged your eyes out for me. What happened? Who got to you? This stuff is repeated over and over and over in the Christian church to this very day. Somebody getting to somebody in Jesus' name. Well, Paul said, that's, that's you. This is me. And we're going to see this in a minute because Silas and Timothy have an opportunity to say, Paul, what are you doing? We'll come to that. Verse 3 now. Paul wanted to have him go on with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region. They all knew that his father was Greek. Well, again, impressed with Timothy, uh, Paul, identifying the leading of the Spirit, brings Timothy in, and wisdom is justified by her children. Subsequent events demonstrate that this was the leading of the Spirit. It was right. And Timothy knew going into this how difficult it was going to be because he knew about Paul's stoning and other hardships. It was almost legendary in, in Paul's day. Remember, Paul, Paul and Barnabas told the apostles all the things that the Holy Spirit had done, including the difficult things. Would news of Timothy joining Paul light a fire under Mark? Remember John Mark? He, too, went with Paul into the mission field, and he retreated in defeat. And uh, Barnabas, uh, thank God for Barnabas, Barnabas strengthened Mark by taking him with him nonetheless on the second time out when Paul would not. But Paul strengthened Mark just as much by not taking him. You know that had to be in his head. Who here likes rejection? And who here, when rejected, just dismiss it? No, it sticks in your head a little bit. I, you know, I, I'm, it was, it was, that guy wasn't me. <laughs> I'm innocent. Or, or the other way around. I blew that. Well, anyway, when news gets to Mark that, hey, Paul picked up a young man named Timothy, you know that registered. Mark's weakness, however, may never have been revealed. It never would have revealed itself had he not got involved. In other words, if he had stayed home in bed and just, you know, let Barnabas and Paul go off, he never would have discovered where his weak points were in ministry. So he goes out, he discovers them, and then he does something about it. He comes back and says, I still would like to go out into the mission field. I'd like a second shot. Of course, Paul said, not with me. Later, he will get that second shot with Paul, and he will do wonderfully. We likely would not have a gospel according to Mark had it not been for his failure and his recovery. If you consider yourself a weak Christian, okay, that's fair. But also consider this. You can be a stronger weak Christian. I don't mean be stronger at being weak. You can be stronger even though relative perhaps to someone else you think you're weak. You can recover a lot of territory and still be useful to the Lord. I'm telling you, just showing up to church, just showing up to formation is a punch in the nose to hell. I mean, if you can stay home and what will hell say? Woohoo! Got another one. I mean, there are times it's justified. I'm not picking at people. But when it's just like, eh, you know, I think I'll stay home and watch cartoons. <laughs> Look, even if they're Looney Tunes, they can wait. There really shouldn't be any other cartoons but Looney Tunes. Anyway, the Church of Corinth, speaking of Looney, Looney Tunes, uh, okay, because we still have Corinthians among us, do we not? Well, anyway, uh, uh, Mark, he had propelled himself into a position that was far beyond what he was ready for. But it wasn't far beyond his Savior. See, this is the kind of stuff you hear in church. This is, you don't get this. Again, you go shopping somewhere. Nobody's going to come up to you and say, hey, you know John Mark recovered? You know you can too? 
I mean, if you do, if somebody does come up to you like that, as a, as a prophet sent to you, it's probably your mom. But anyway, <laughs> Mark, Mark propelled himself into ministry, and it was far beyond him, but it was not beyond his Savior. And I shout back at that statement I just made with a loud voice and say, me too. Me too. It may be beyond my means, my ability, but not my Lord. And I have to remember sometime, you know, when I'm doing my self-loathing thing, like, you know, I should just, you know, I should just be a millionaire and, and not, no, I don't think that. I, well, I wish it, but I don't think it. But, I mean, you know, I, I don't, I'm not worthy to be a pastor. And, it, of course, we settle that all the time, you know, yeah, we know that. And yet, God put me in this position. So what am I going to do, bad mouth that? You shouldn't have put me in this position? Not at all. It's okay. This is, what I, this is it. This is my, this is my lot. This is, this is the lot that I've been assigned. And now I'm going to till it. And I'm going to sow it. And I'm going to reap the fruit from it for the Lord because he's Lord of the harvest. Anyway, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region. Well, this was a field decision of, of Paul. And it seemed Paul to Paul to be right, and, and it opens up sort of a can of worms. And this won't be the last time in the book of Acts that we, we have one of these moments. His action to circumcise Timothy is, is startling because, well, didn't we just finish that in Jerusalem? Didn't they just come out and say, hey, we don't have to do any of this stuff? Well, there's more to the story here. This is a gray zone. Now, we don't hear of this happening again, but it happened here. Paul was already being hounded as somebody who tossed Moses away. And that, that's going to haunt him. And he's, he's up to it, though. You know, if, if I don't preach the cross, then why am I still persecuted? You know, so, so he, he, he's ready for it. But Paul felt that because Timothy's mother was Jewish and he was not circumcised, ministry amongst the Jews who were zealots when it came to this would be hindered. So Paul eliminates the hindrance. That's his field decision. He says, you know, there's, only, there's a way around this. If I'm going to be invited into the synagogues and bring Timothy with me, if I'm going to be invited into Jewish homes and elaborate on the Messiah, I've got to get Timothy accepted because they're not going to accept him the way he is right now. And later, he, of course, he refuses. He, earlier, he refused to, to do this to Titus because Titus was a, a, a total Gentile. And the Jews would not have given him a hard time. Paul had already written, for in Christ, Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision, avails anything but a new creation. It's Nehushtan. However, there is a reality there. And you know the missionaries who had to, the, the older missionaries that went into, you know, the, uh, the Polynesian islands and up where the Eskimos were, they had to sidestep a lot of things. I mean, when people come out not dressed, you know, like, whoa, whoa, please put something. They couldn't do that. They had to sit there and, and just, you know, sort of continue with and stay focused uh, with what they have been called to do. They had to make field decisions. And when food was put in front of those missionaries, they couldn't say, what is that? I'm not eating grub <laughs> grubs. You just got that out the backyard. I'm not eating that. Uh, but they had to. And they were very successful in doing it. And so Paul eliminates the hindrance in Timothy's case to gain fuller access to the Jews. It was affording a tactical advantage to what was going on in Paul's work. And without this, doors would have slammed in their face. And so, yeah, Paul is not saying doctrinally this helpful. No, he's not saying that. This is not because of doctrine. This is because of people. And it's not really going to hurt anything if we understand it that's way. That, that is where he's going with this. In chapter 21, a similar situation will come up. And I think Paul's going to make a mistake there. It doesn't make a mistake in his writing of Scripture. But some of his actions, uh, you know, are like, well, you know, that, that, that's not 100% where it should have been. Well, we know he's not perfect. Because if he was, then he'd be the Messiah. And he's not. So uh, anyway, we'll get to that when we get to it. That should not unnerve you. It should actually encourage you. And so his aim was to reach sitters, uh, and he had to deal with this sacred cow. 
Are there sacred cows in Christianity today, in churches today, in Christians? You bet there is. There are things that if you don't do, it has nothing to do with anything. Some sort of tradition somebody thought up in their garage that survived over the decades. And if you don't adhere to it, oh, brother, that's it for you uh, when Christ doesn't lay it on you. Anyway, um, how would they know Timothy wasn't circumcised? Well, just ask. Isn't his, is, isn't his mom Jewish? Yeah. Is he circumcised? Now, Paul's not going to lie to them and say, oh, yeah, yeah. No, he, he does the right thing. So the next clause we come to here in verse 3, for they all knew that his father was Greek. See, there it is. That's why Luke puts that in there, because they would have inquired. They would have deduced. His father was Greek. His father would have prohibited this. And therefore, you're ignoring Moses if you want to come up in here and tell us about the Messiah. Timothy allowed this. And what does that tell us? I'm going to repeat this twice. Timothy paid to serve. Timothy paid to serve. He wasn't paid. I mean, it, he wasn't being paid. He had to suffer this right. If he was going to serve on the field of ministry, he had to hurt. The knife had to be turned on him. I'll be remembering that in hard times of ministry because there are a lot more problems in ministry than there are without it. You can, you can just fly around, woohoo, I'm a Christian, Jesus died for me, if you're not serving. But if you're serving, you're getting, you're getting flack. You're going to be hit. And uh, hopefully, because if you're not, you're not serving in the right place. Verse 4, and as they went through the cities, they delivered to them the decrees to keep, which were determined by the apostles and elders at Jerusalem. So Luke is straight up with this. He says, you know, they didn't have to do this before Christ. Before the Lord Jesus Christ, Timothy was 100% justified as a believer, just by faith. But because of the Jews and because of ministry, Paul made that choice. Uh, so there's the decree from the council. Paul shows it to them, and uh, they, they would be delighted at hearing this. Verse 5, so the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. Well, all pastors should aspire to want to strengthen the church according to the scriptures, wherever, whatever that cost, and it will cost. It would have weakened the church had Jerusalem demanded that the Gentiles become Jewish before believers. Well, that was settled in chapter 15. But it interesting statement here, an increase in number. This is still what God wants. However, who builds the church? Well, Jesus said this is what he does. Matthew 16, verse 18, and I also say to you that you are Peter. On this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail. Who builds the church? Does he say, uh, and you will build a church, Peter. The pastors will build a church. The congregation will build a church. He says he builds the church. Now, he can't do it without the congregation and the pastor. He doesn't do it that way. Acts 2.47, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. It does not say, and the Christians added to the church. See, this is a sacred cow. Because there are Christians that try to recruit to the church. There's a difference between recruiting to the church and evangelizing and preaching Christ and salvation. I mean, it's not, I'm not saying you shouldn't invite people to church. Uh, uh, some of you can say, not, uh, well, may hopefully none of you can say, but <laughs> all right, I won't say it. Well, too late, I started it, right? I can't leave you hanging there. But you can't say to somebody, would you mind coming to my future ex-church? You see, something's wrong with that. And you get an overview of what's happening in Christianity, and you say, you know what, that's not. This has got to be addressed. Where does it start? Well, it starts in the pulpit. What is the point of having a messenger if the message is disregarded? And if that message is in agreement with the greater message of Scripture, woe to him who ignores it. Is... Any more commentary necessary on this? 
I, I don't think so. I think it says it all. The number increased, and it was the Lord doing it, and he was using Paul and Silas and Timothy and others also. Verse 6. Now, when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. Now, here, notice the pronoun, and we still adhere to pronouns around this place. <laughs> when they, see, Luke's not part of the group yet. Later, that pronoun will change to we. So we'll get to that in a moment. It's just, that's important because, because I'll show you why later. Anyway, this is very strong language here. They were forbidden by the Holy Spirit. Hmm. I, I don't believe the church should be committed to a marketing agency. I don't think churches should hire people to tell them how to grow the church. Again, that is the work of the Holy Spirit. And you live with what you get. Uh, this is... Uh, this should alert us, this language. And I mentioned to you, this has so many lessons in this chapter that I feel are, are bypassed by some. There are times when God does want to withhold our witness, when he wants us to be quiet and not preach. Do Christians tend to disagree with God's prohibitions? When God says, I don't do it that way in, in the scripture. Do Christians, uh, you answer the question, uh, do they say, yeah, yeah, that's fine, but here's a marketing tactic we want to employ that works better. Matthew chapter 5, these 12 Jesus sent out and commanded them saying, do not go into the way of the Gentiles and do not enter the city of the Samaritans. So he's telling them, don't go preaching there. And we're seeing Paul subject to that teaching. So we follow the New Testament and there, there's your witness, two of them. Matthew 16, 20. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Messiah. Now we know why he is doing that at that point, but the, 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 what comes out of this is there are times that God wants us to be quiet. We don't have to know the reason. He doesn't owe us an explanation. Here the Holy Spirit is saying, I don't want you going up into Bithynia to the north, and I don't want you going to the south to Asia Minor. I'm going to tell you where to go when I'm good and ready. That's what it, how it ends up. He, God doesn't have that tone with him. He just doesn't tell him. I love this stuff. God has told me no many times. Sometimes I'm very grateful. Sometimes I get, oh, man, dodged a bullet. Other times a little disappointed because I want what I want. And I think my way is, you know, when I'm in the flesh. I think my way is better for me, which is always wrong. The flesh is never, ever right, like Satan. Satan never sides with God, and if he appears to, it's as an angel of light, and he's setting you up for an ambush. So there are just these rules that we live by, these policies from the kingdom that are right. Do Christians in ministries <clears throat> resent this rule of the kingdom? I'll give you another rule of the kingdom. You can't serve two masters. You'll love one, you'll hate the other. you got to commit. And if you're wishy-washy, <clears throat> you like one more than the other, that's what you're going to be, wishy-washy. Excuse me. <clears throat> Does anyone have shrimp cocktail? Because I could use some right now. <clears throat> All right, coming back to this. When the Christian is denied permission, what does the Christian do? Does he push it up the hill? I'm going to force this. This is right. Think how many people are going to get saved. When a Christian is dating and finds out this person is not for me, do they continue anyway? And just, you know, but I like them. Man, I'm not going to find anybody that's much fun. Nobody understands me. But Christ, God has clearly said, no, don't do this. God tends to work two ways, slowly and mysteriously. And we're watching it. And we're going to develop this thought. Because if we have here in Paul a man who is being led by the Spirit and nobody else, and we have those following Paul who is being by, led by Paul in the Spirit and not themselves. The open door into Europe, it came through the slamming of doors to Bithynia and Asia. And the church at Philippi is going to be born out of this, and that is one of the best churches in the New Testament. Philippi, Philadelphia, Smyrna, uh, Colossae, these were churches that were just, man, that's, I would go to that church. 
Laodicea, uh, I don't think I'd want to go there. I don't think they'd want me there after about five minutes. What's that on the wall? What is that on your back table? Why do you have that there? You read that book? Why do you like that guy? Sorry, going to have to do some kung fu on you because this is not permitted. <laughs> Revelation 3.8, Jesus said to the church at Philadelphia, which incidentally is in Asia where Paul is forbidden to go, which tells us later on there are going to be churches in that area where he's now forbidden. There are going to be no less than eight of them that we know of. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door. This is what God does. But when that door is shut, don't you try to kick it in. And if Paul said, well, we're going to Bithynia anyway. There are people up there. They need the gospel. Then he would have been kicking that door open. And Christ says, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. And that's what he's going to find in, in Philippi when he gets there. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Bookmark that. You got a little strength part. That means you're a weakling. Imagine, you know, wrestling, I don't know, somebody, Andre the Giant, and he says, you have little strength. He's saying you're a weakling compared to him. Well, this is a true picture of the church because Jesus said, without me, you, do, you can do nothing. Lessons that uh, we need. And also we need to learn from this that every need is not a calling for you. Just because you see something and you think, I can do that, that's not how we're led by the Spirit. The Lord doesn't say, if you feel like you can do it, do it. That's the world. There are other lies. Uh, you can be anything you want. No, you can't. You cannot be anything you want, and anybody that's telling you that is lying. Or just for, maybe they're not lying intentionally. They just bought into it. Um, I can't be a salesman for hair shampoo. It's not going to happen. Nobody's going to say, you know, we could really sell more product if you just endorse this. They'd go out of business right after the first commercial. Anyway, <laughs> you want to look like me? Buy this. <laughs> after they had come to, but you can do anything. And then you put Jesus' name on it, right? In Christ, I can do all things. I know that, that's not true. It's, it's out of context. If you keep that in context. He talks about having and not having. Anyway, uh, verse 7, And they had come to uh, Mysia. They tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So here's the guidance of the Holy Spirit, and he's guiding God's people by hindering God's people. Well, see, the flesh doesn't understand that. The Spirit doesn't need to understand it. It submits to it. Uh, that's why he's Lord. And if he has to answer, well, why are you doing it that way, Lord? Every time you ask, uh, then we have a big problem. Bithynia was a heavily populated area on the Black Sea. It's still there, but it goes by a, another name now. Well, not the Black Sea. Uh, and Asia Minor, uh, that's a peninsula. Uh, that's Turkey. Modern Turkey is a peninsula. It's surrounded water on three sides. The Aegean, uh, the, the, um, the other two seas, the Mediterranean, the, the, the Marmara Sea, there's another one. Anyway, uh, Asia Minor is modern-day Turkey, where the churches of Revelation and Colossae and Hierapolis are located. The gospel, as I mentioned, eventually gets there. Looking at Paul's travel on a map on this second trip, we notice that there's a straight course between these two regions. God is just moving him right through it. But that's, there's more to the story than just, just that. Because the Lord disallowing them to turn to the north, Bithynia, or turn to the south, Asia Minor. Steadily advancing towards Philippi in Europe, and he doesn't even know it. He's walking by faith, not by sight. Psalm 37, verse 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. They're commanded by the Lord. It doesn't say suggested. Sometimes they are. Sometimes God is, you know, this, you know, gives us a, an option. Uh, he gave me an option in ministry. You want to be a pastor? You want to be more prophetic. The prophetic is the one that goes against, uh, you know, all the bad things that are out there. The pastor is supposed to love people. Moment of silence. <laughs> I, and I got to tell you, I never thought I'd love people so much. It might not show, but it's there. I couldn't pray for people if it wasn't there. 
uh, regardless of what they think of me. How could they think anything less of me? <laughs> you know, people have all sorts of beliefs, all sorts of, you know, customs and manners. But you can't answer them all. You've got to be who you are. Maybe they'll be friendly enough for you to interact and figure it out. And if not, well, you just got to keep doing what you're doing. Verse 8, so passing by Amicia, they came to Troas. Now, here's what I've been talking about. The, we have the leadership, the leader, Paul, who is under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Then we have Silas and Timothy who are following Paul. And there are probably some others unnamed, too. Would Silas and Timothy begin to wonder, what is going on here? We just keep passing these cities. Where's all this preaching we heard about Paul and Barnabas doing? Some, the apostolic miracles. Where's some stoning? Paul can take another one. <laughs> they were prepared for tremendous ministry. The happening church. Everybody's going to hear Paul speak in Mysia. No, nobody was going to hear him speak. Where are the sermons and the conversions? Where's the bitter oppositions, the stripes, the, the hairbreadth escapes from these violent people who don't want to hear the gospel? This is what they signed on for. And they didn't get it. They anticipated a trail of churches stretching from Lystra all the way to Troas, there by the Aegean Sea. This, this had to start maybe playing on them with did Paul lose his zeal? Is the Lord no longer using him? Has he, is he no longer in touch and relevant to the culture? I don't know that they were thinking that. My, 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 my feeling is these men just loved Paul, were led by the Spirit too, and said, Paul, we got your back no matter what happens. We'll trek through wherever until God shows us. But we know that that's not the case with everyone to this day. How come the church isn't doing this? How come the church isn't doing that? Follow the leader. This is the lesson. There was nothing happening. This aimless walking from place to place. No new, no fresh ministry to boast of. But Paul was the apostle. And he rejected any suggestions if he got them. Well, why don't we go to Bithynia? Well, why don't we go to, why don't we stay here and give it time? But he's the leader and he's acting like one. Led by the Holy Spirit, not by the flock. He keeps, you, you might be saying, you sound like you're trying to teach us something. <laughs> yeah, because that's what the Bible's teaching us. And this is the lesson I think is greatly ignored by many Christians. If you're going to serve, you're going to be inconvenienced, you're going to be wondering what's happening. You're going to have time where nothing is growing. And you say, I've planted much and I have reaped little. And unless you've got some definite outstanding sin to put your hand on, it's the, it's the Lord. Small things can grow into big things. And hell knows that. But a lot of Christians, do, do we? Do we know that? Zechariah 4.10. And Zechariah 4, and this is, this is the prophet stirring the people to rebuild their place of worship. The Babylonians had wiped it out. Seventy years later, they come back under Zerubbabel. And they start to build a temple. They get the foundation laid. Then the boogeyman shows up. And they all go run away. And the temple stops for 15 years. All you have was a slab, so to speak. And then God raised up the prophets Haggai and Zechariah. And Haggai says, uh, Zechariah says, remember Solomon's temple? Some of you saw Solomon's temple. Now look at this. And then he adds, for who has despised the day of small things? This temple is big to God. And then he goes on to, well, earlier he said, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Oh, yeah? That means don't go to Bithynia, don't go to Asia, go where I'm telling you to go. That's what it means, not by might, not by power, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord, even when you don't like it. Luke 19, 17. And he said to them, well done, good and faithful servant, because you were faithful in very little, have authority over ten cities. What happens if Christ says, very good, you were faithful in the very little, I'll see you later. You're not owed. We're not entitled because we've been faithful in little things. We're not entitled to big things. Look at Jeremiah. Look how faithful he was. And the nation was what? Swept away. This is Christianity. 
Second Corinthians, uh, Second Chronicles, using Old Testament uh, events to demonstrate New Testament truths. But you be strong and do not let your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. When? When I'm good and ready, God says. Maybe when you get to heaven. Walking around with your knuckles scraping, oh, well, I can't believe this is happening. I thought this. They had to wait, and God says, I'll make it worth it. Maybe not in this lifetime, but I'll make it worth it. Verse 9, we're almost out of time, so you're going to have to speed up. <laughs> and a vision appeared to Paul in, an, in the night. A man from Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Paul saw a Macedonian man in a vision. A vision is what you see. You're shown something by God while you are still awake. And a dream is, of course, you, you get the benefit of some rest. <laughs> this man in the vision, see how God works? He's saying there's a hunger and thirst for righteousness over here. The man in the vision demonstrates this through his pleading a very strong Greek language, and in the English too, pleading with them to come with the word of Christ. Now, they're in Macedonia, across the Aegean. They'll travel 150 miles across there about. These people don't even know they're coming. There's no Macedonian over there. Hey, bring us the news about Messiah. When he gets there, it's going to be a woman named Lydia. And it's just like, wait a minute. The vision and the reality are not in agreement. You know, verb, noun, agreement kind of a thing's not happening here. But God plows through this. And that church in Philippi is going to, Lydia is going to beg these guys to stay with her. You got to love that woman. She's just like, stay at my house. And I will not take no for an answer. You got to preach to me or I'll kill you. <laughs> <laughs> what if Paul, what if he did not obey? So, you know what? I kind of like Troas here, right on the coast. Not too far from you know, Cilicia, where I lived for a long time, grew up. Well, God would have found someone else. You've got to have part of this in your Christianity, I have found. Over my dead body, there's got to be some resolve that says, this is what I'm called to. I have authority to this calling. Because some people say, I'm called to this. It's not their place. <laughs> it's not their calling. There's somebody else in that position. It's not theirs. But if it is you, God says, this is what I've appointed you to do. Then you got, I think it's beneficial to have that resolve over my dead body because you know that it's worth, it's worth it. Okay, I'd be interested to know what you thought about that when we get to heaven. All right, so go, moving, verse 10. Now, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. <laughs> so they, they concluded, they realized the leading. You know, if you're too sure of yourself in Christ, some people don't like that. They want you to wring your fingers. They want you to be, you know, confusion is weakness. And we try to get that out of our life. I don't even like being like, you know, you know what aisle is the soap on? I want to know where that aisle is. It doesn't work that way. I end up asking somebody. And um, they said, I'll tell you, over my dead body. <laughs> no. Then they couldn't tell me. Okay. I, I, don't, I don't like the volume of laughter, so no more jokes for you this morning. Coming back to this, here we have this abrupt change in the narrative, in the text, from the third person to the first person, from they to us. And so we reread verse 10. Now, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. So you see, the leading is like God wants us to cross the sea and go into this really Gentile world. And that's all they had. The vision is pretty, pretty strong, but you don't find them saying, well, Paul, we didn't get the vision. You got the vision. They caught the vision. And when you can find Christians that catch a vision, you can do a lot of stuff. And it hurts to see people who have the talent but not the availability. You can't do anything with it. Uh, you can, no matter what talent you have, if you're not available, who needs it? It's useless. Well, anyway, 
there are going to be several of these shifts. It, it reads as though, it's going to read as though Luke stays in Philippi because the pronouns will change again and uh, they, we won't get him back to we until chapter 20. And so f about five, six years will pass, which leads us to, to believe Luke probably stayed in Philippi, part of the church leadership, and he also may have done some of his research for his gospel and the book of Acts that, that we now have. So Acts, um, we, we, we're out of time, but here we have the leader led by the Spirit, this outstanding loyalty of, of three men. The first is a Jew named Silas. The second is a Jew, Greek, named Timothy. The third is a Greek or Macedonian named, named Luke. And uh, they're, 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 in, they're united as one unit. They're moving as one unit. Hell sees that and doesn't like it. And so I close with Acts chapter 20, verse 6. But we sail. This is when it, he comes back to the group with the pro, according to the pronouns. But we sail from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and in five days journeyed, uh, joined them at Troas where we stayed seven days. So he's going back from Philippi across the Aegean to Troas and Luke is, is with them again. Uh, I love this kind of stuff. Let's pray. We're going to have communion. I'll close this session of study with prayer as the men make preparation. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that the lessons that you share to us are put to use. That we think about them, meditate on them, and may they uh, influence us to be pliable in your hands against our own flesh in agreement with your spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name.